Uh, thank you. I have to move straight on as we are, uh, we're really short of time now. The next item of business is debate on motion 17781 in the name of Kevin Stewart on planning Scotland Bill. Before I invite Kevin Stewart to open the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown consent to the Bill. I call on Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The, for the purpose of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the planning Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests so far as they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now begin the debate. I think I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. I, can I just say, uh, Minister, I'm so sorry, I don't think your microphone's on. I, I mean, I'm talking about the microphone. Well, I, no, I, I pushed my card <laughs> further in, so. Uh, President officer, uh, I'm delighted that we finally arrived at the stage three debate on this bill. A lot has happened since it was first introduced in December 2017. However, even now, after all of the time and all of these amendments, I'm not yet tired of talking about planning uh, and I'm looking forward to the debate this afternoon. Uh, Scotland needs uh, a world-class planning system. Uh, planning uh, affects all of our interests in the long term. Our future economy, our communities and our environment can all benefit if we get this bill right. The original aims of the bill uh, were to streamline the system so that planners could focus on le less on procedures and more on planning uh, places for people. Uh, the global thinker and pioneering town planner, Scotland's own Patrick Geddes, said that planning should be about place, work and folk. There is no neater way to summarise the contribution that planning can make to supporting sustainable and inclusive growth. And we need a planning system that understands what people need and want, that enables good quality development, and that is truly empowered to deliver great places. When the review of the Scottish planning system started, it aimed to look at planning from a user's perspective. And the review recognized that users of, the plan of planning include other public sector interests, communities and individuals, as well as developers. And although the review set out to support housing delivery, the independent panel's report was not an agenda for deregulation or a developer's charter. By making the system more collaborative, it aimed to empower planning to deliver great places. Following this direction of travel, uh, we carried out a great deal of work before the bill was drafted. It involved the many different interests in planning to help shape proposals for change. However, it was clear then, and it has been throughout the parliamentary process, that it is very difficult for everyone to agree on how the system can be improved. The bill was always going to be a challenge. Planning is an important uh, but often controversial subject. Planning is complex because communities are complex and at times its jargon can seem impenetrable. And for a time, uh, this bill uh, became a little bit complicated too. Uh, but after many hours of discussion and debate, I believe that we have achieved what we set out to do. Planning is clearly of interest to all of us. Many members have raised important issues that they want it to address. The scale of amendments at stage two and indeed at stage three has been remarkable. And as we near the end of the process, I believe that we have struck a good balance. The bill should be clear about what this parliament wants planning to do, but should also allow local flexibility to reflect local circumstances and the different needs of Scotland's people and places. The structural changes introduced by this bill will make planning much more straightforward more open and better place to respond to a changing world. 
as well as supporting sustainable and inclusive gr economic growth, this Parliament has made it clear that planning can improve our quality of life and should be more open and accountable to the communities we serve. Amendments have underlined the importance of planning for housing, including housing for older people and for disabled folk, equalities and health. And the bill will bring new powers to address issues, including short-term lets and the impacts of new development on music venues. Patrick Geddes also pioneered the concept of thinking globally and acting locally. Sustainable development is now an integral part of a new, newly defined purpose for planning. And I'm pleased that there is a clear requirement to tackle climate change as a high level outcome on the face of the bill. We know that planning should help us to make the most of our natural as assets. And the bill reflects the importance of rural development, forestry, green space, play, environmental protection, and built heritage. These are important. Our places, our well-being, and our economy depend on the health of our environment. And whilst we may have had different views on the best way of achieving these things, it is very welcome that the Parliament has set out these priorities so clearly. I've been very keen to ensure that this bill uh, will empower communities to have a positive say in shaping their future. Uh, we have built in opportunities for everyone in society, be, society to be engaged in creating development plans, including children and young people, gypsy travellers and disabled people. I'll give way to Mr um, Finney. Neil Finlay. Finlay. Does the Minister accept that uh, if we pass the bill as it stands, there will be an inherent imbalance still within the system in favour of developers over communities? I disagree with that completely and utterly. Uh, yes, you need um, to conclude shortly, Minister. I, I disagree with that completely and utterly. We've put in place local place plans, and I've been quite clear uh, from the very beginning. What we don't want is conflict at the end of the process. We want folk empowered at the beginning of the process uh, and have their views heard at that point. Um, President officer, uh, communities uh, will have a new right to prepare local place plans which planning authorities will need to take into account in the same way as they do the national planning framework. Uh, I'm confident that communities from all backgrounds are willing and able to grasp this opportunity to plan their own places. Uh, we have also put in place new arrangements to support improved performance in the planning system. And I want everyone to be confident that members of planning authorities have the understanding uh, to enable them to make sound decisions. And I'm afraid you must conclude, I'm sorry. I, I've got numerous organisations that have, I'd Minister, like to thank. I wish I could hear I'll them do it in the summing up, presiding officer. Thank, thank you. you have much. you moved your motion, please? I, I move the motion. Thank you very much. Name. And I will call on Graeme Simpson, equally tight for time, Mr Simpson. So, here we are, at the end of the road of the most amended bill in the history of the Scottish Parliament. A journey which, for MSP, started in December 2017 when the bill was introduced but for others uh, started much earlier. It was way back in September 2015 that the Scottish Government appointed an independent panel to review the planning system. In May 2016 the panel published a statement and their final report empowering planning to deliver great places. This contained 48 recommendations for reform over six main themes. In January 2017, the government issued a consultation, Places, People and Planning, which ran until the April. Then there was a position statement in June 2017, and then, of course, the bill in the December of that year. And that's when the problem started. MSPs got their hands on it, and the minister started having sleepless nights. The Local Government and Communities Committee did not hold back in its report on the bill in May last year. It was critical of virtually every section. Convener Bob Doris was swiftly moved on, along with Jenny Gilruth. James Dornan came in as convener and faced a barrage of amendments, over 300 of them, and seven weeks of watching the minister squirm, after which he, the minister, <laughs> described the bill as a guddle. He was right. In the stage one debate on the bill, I said it achieved the almost impossible by pleasing no one not house builders, not councils, not the environment lobby. It was silent on the environment, 
and did nothing to achieve growth or deliver the new homes we so desperately need. So my approach for the final stage of the bill has been to try to rectify that, to sort out the goodle, and to try and end up with something that delivers for all. I think we've done that. Now, I've listened over the past two and a bit days to some utter rubbish from Labour and the Greens. Accusations, accusations of a stitch-up between us and the SNP of deals. Monica Lennon even accused me of betrayal yesterday. That's a strong word and I hope she'll reflect on it. I worked very well with Mrs. Lennon and Andy Whiteman at stage two. I was looking forward to working with Monica Lennon's replacement, Alex Rowley, but he's shown no interest in doing so. He was not engaged. He's hidden away in his 70s tribal labor cave and not come out. The minister, however, having suffered a series of bloody noses at stage two, has been keen to talk. I've got no problems at all in working with the government where we agree on things. They've been welcoming of good ideas from these benches and we've achieved a lot of positive results. Let's have a look at some of them. We have the housing needs of older and disabled people recognized in the planning system thanks to, I'm not taking interventions from Labour, we've heard more than, uh, more than enough from Labour over the past two days. Alex, so we've got the housing needs of older and disabled people recognized in the planning system thanks to Jeremy Balfour, Alexander Stewart, and I also should mention Kenny Gibson. Mr. Balfour worked with Mary Fee to bring in amendments on changing places facilities. Alexander Stewart tightened up the procedure on the infrastructure levy so people don't pay twice for the same thing. Adam Tompkins introduced the agent of change principle into the bill. And we had the unedifying spectacle on Tuesday of three middle-aged men trying to show their street cred by reeling off names of music venues they'd heard of. <laughs> Rachel Hamilton's amendment on short-term <laughs> lets will give councils the power to crack down in areas where there's a problem like Edinburgh. And this, hopefully combined with a tough licensing regime, should make a real difference. I've had a few successes myself on the national planning framework. There must now be targets for the use of land across Scotland. When preparing the MPF, ministers must be given information about the built heritage of an area, the educational capacity and the housing needs of the population. There's also now a robust procedure so that Parliament can scrutinise the MPF. On local development plans, the bread and butter of the planning system, they must also refer to the built heritage. The housing needs of the population of the area must also be taken into account. And ministers must issue guidance to planning authorities about undertaking effective community engagement in relation to the local plan. Those councils covered by the Central Scotland Green Network should consult them on their LDPs. We have a purpose for planning, a concise one. We have the, build, the beginnings of a self-build revolution. We now have the requirement for housing land allocations to be agreed before they go into the plan, and that should provide certainty for communities and those wanting to invest. Councils must tell people they can prepare local place plans, and those same people can say which places are important to them in those plans. Biodiversity now features in the bill. And yesterday, even the Labour Party agreed to my amendment introducing mediation into the system. That will give communities a real say and hopefully avoid the conflict that mires the system at the moment. So we now have a bill that can deliver growth across Scotland, that is greener, that includes communities in the decisions that affect them, and I commend this Tory-style bill to the Chamber. Uh, thank you, Mr Simpson. I call on Alec Rowley. Mr Rowley, please. Presiding officer, and leading on this bill for Labour, I have asked myself, what are the big issues for planning and development in Scotland? First, a major block to housing development, and one I have raised many times in this chamber, is the lack of upfront finance for infrastructure. By infrastructure, I do not mean roads and utilities, although there are challenges there, but what I mean is schools, health and community facilities. This, in my mind, is a major block to housing building, and will this bill do anything to address that? No, it will not. 
Second, there is a real sense of alienation in communities across Scotland where they have been experiencing the planning processes. Will this bill do anything to address that? It most certainly will not. Third, the planning system as it currently stands does little to support development and regeneration both in town centres and post-industrial communities. Will this bill do anything to address that? No, it will not. Fourth, the only people that seem to be in denial about the impact on our communities of short-term lets is the Tories and the SNP in this place. Will this bill do anything about these concerns? Sadly, it will not. Fifth, will this bill address the unacceptable level of cuts in finance and staffing and planning departments? No, it will not. All of this is why Scottish Labour will be voting against the planning bill today, because frankly, it has become a missed opportunity to deliver real change that is so desperately needed in the planning system in Scotland. That is not to say that there are not positive elements to the bill. I am pleased we have managed to secure some amendments that will make a difference. However, on the whole, this bill does not go anywhere near far enough as it needed to do. The planning system should be more engaging and used to empower people and communities, drive economic regeneration and protect the environment that we can all be proud of. It is disappointing that neither the SNP nor the Tories seem willing to support legislation that can achieve this. Instead, they seem to be quite content to vote together to put through legislation that won't tackle the big problems we face as a country. This bill will not solve our housing crisis. It will not tackle the problems of a lack of joined up approach to government, nor will it deliver a necessary national house building strategy. Instead, it is unambitious in its scope, which is disappointing as it had the potential to do so much more. This bill could have transformed the way we plan our communities. It could have made our planning system less opaque and introduce a much needed democratic element to our approach to planning. This was an opportunity for a more balanced share of power between communities and developers. It could have brought communities and social change to the forefront. But sadly, the approach that has been taken instead is unambitious and is essentially business as usual. The SNP and Tories were happy to vote together to block communities having the form of equal right of appeal in planning decisions. I have tried to put forward amendments that would rebalance power in the planning system and give communities a right of appeal with developers to a level playing field and make the system fairer for all. Yet this is not supported by the parties, the Tories and SNP in this chamber, who instead seem quite content to lend their support to big developers rather than communities, the communities that they are elected to represent. To be honest, presiding officer, this bill has become an SNP Tory stitch up, and I hope communities across the country will remember this when they experience the planning process themselves. Regretfully, without the change that is required to ensure the bill delivers a planning system which works in the interests of the many, Scottish Labour will vote against this planning bill today. Thank you very much, Mr. Rowley. I now call Andy Whiteman. Mr. Whiteman, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, after many hours of debate and months of parliamentary procedure, we do indeed reach the end uh, of the road. And despite our differences along the way, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Local Government Committee, uh, particularly Alex Rowley and Monica Lennon, for their willingness to work together in putting in substantial efforts on the bill. We've had some fun along the way as well. I'm disappointed in the tone of Graeme Simpson's opening remarks, but nevertheless, I thank him for the times we did work well together, there were good times and I have fond memories. Um, I'd also like to thank the Minister uh, and his officials for their constructive engagement in some of what myself and Green colleagues uh, were indeed interested in. We secured important amendments on public toilets and water refill points, took up some time at stage two on gypsy travellers, on air quality, on open spaces, on forestry strategies and on the purpose of planning. 
Now, at the third reading of the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, uh, Lewis Silken, who was Labour's Minister of Town and Country Planning, noted that planning is concerned to ensure that our limited land resources are used to the best advantage of the nation as a whole, and it provides for resolving the often conflicting com claims upon any particular piece of land. But over the past few decades, the private developer has become the prime mover in the planning system rather than the public authority. And as a result, public trust has broken down. It's been eroded and powerful private interests of money have corrupted the public interest. Presenting officer, this bill was an opportunity to fundamentally reform how planning works. And yes, to streamline and to simplify where possible, but more importantly, to deliver a decisive shift in favor of a proper plan-led system where planners, elected members, communities can work together in a collaborative effort to shape the places where we live, work and play. Now, I know that ambition is about much more than legislation, and I know a variety of excellent practice taking place across Scotland it, to engage communities and to facilitate high-quality placemating. But the whole system still suffers from excessive complexity and over the past 30 years has placed greater and greater emphasis on the interests of private interests. And nowhere is this more clear than our, in our collective failure, again, to reform appeal rights. Not, I stress, to introduce a third party right of appeal, but to reform the whole system of appeals. Now, in our stage one report, we were clear in our unanimous recommendation, 224, we said the committee is conscious that the availability of appeals to applicants undermines confidence in a plan-led system. Appeals can be lodged free of charge and irrespective of whether an application is in accordance with the development plan. The committee believes that in a plan-led system, appeals should only be allowed in certain circumstances. Now, as Dr. Andy Inch from Planning Democracy said in oral evidence, the planning system is adversarial because of the discretion that exists at the end of the process, which by and large means that speculative development applications are put forward and people react to them. So an ambition to upfront planning has to be matched by the integrity of the plan. And in such a scenario, no appeal should be allowed at all. And a properly considered determination should stand as the final word. Presenting officer, in 2015, when Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil announced there'd be an independent review of the planning system, he said it would be a root and branch review with game-changing ideas for radical reform. And when the independent panel reported back, Housing Minister Kevin Stewart, a planning minister, Housing Kevin Stewart, welcomed this work, noting that it would help form the basis to kickstart a new, focused and revitalised planning system. Instead, we were given a bill which delivered business as usual for the planning system, while proposing a degree of centralisation, which was quite alarming. Happy. Minister. Of the panel and its report back, um, would Mr Whiteman recognise uh, that the panel itself, the independent panel, were not in favour of third party rights of appeal and they suggested, which we have followed, that we needed to do more engagement up front, which we have done in this bill? Andy Whiteman. I recognise the panel rejected third party right of appeal, but they said nothing about applicants' right of appeal. They didn't even look at it. Now, as we contemplate the bill in its final form, apart from a bit of tinkering around the edges, there's nothing that's radical or game-changing. Nothing to protect communities against their hollowing out by short-term lets. Nothing to bring hill tracks and the vandalism under democratic scrutiny. Presiding officer, I think at the heart of this failure is a failure process. Now, had I been planning minister, here's how I'd have proceeded. First of all, I'd have convened a cross-party roundtable talks to discuss the interest concerns of members. Second, I'd have introduced a consolidating bill rather than an amending bill that's proven so difficult for the electorate to understand. Third, I'd have set up a coherent vision and set of principles to underpin the bill. It was notable at stage one when I asked the minister what the general principles of the bill were, he did not have an answer. And finally, I would have maintained and worked to build that cross-party consensus throughout this process. But we are where we are. Presiding officer, I know that the minister is a big fan of the 1952 Aberdeen City Plan. Tom Johnson, the former Secretary of State, wrote in the foreword, observed that the alternative to planning is no planning. It is chaos and waste. And yes, the purpose of planning is at the very least to prevent chaos and waste, but it's more positively to promote the allocation of land in the public interest and for the common good. And that ambition is still not being realised. Presenting officer, in the stage one debate, I made the following comments. I said, Greens can't believe that planning can and must be a force for good for delivering high quality environments, reducing inequalities and promoting public interest in the use of land. To achieve that, substantial amendment will be required. 
If this was the final bill, I said then, we would be voting against it tonight. It can be improved, however, and we will therefore be voting to keep it in play. It is our considered view that this bill has not had the substantial amendment required to transform the planning system in the way we envisage to deliver a plan-led system where communities have autonomy to determine for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wyman. I call Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the tidal wave of insults that Graham, uh, Graham Simpson offered members um, during one of the more indecorous uh, contributions I've heard in this chamber, he reminded of us of two things. First is the, uh, the establishment in 2015 of the panel, the expert panel, on which no planner sat um, and was given almost impossibly tight timescales to report. He also reminded us of the fact that this is one of the most amended bills in parliamentary history. Both of those realities give the measure of one of the reasons, one of the many reasons my party, and I'm glad to see the Labour Party and the Greens, will not be supporting it tonight. It is bad legislation. The Liberal Democrats were, of course, the, the only party to oppose this bill at stage one. I'll come on to the reasons for that, but I welcome very much uh, the Labour Party and the Green Party in standing in opposition tonight uh, as they will do so. We oppose this bill because it is a manifest exercise in centralisation. It presupposes that Edinburgh-based bureaucrats know more about the needs and interests of communities around this country than locally elected councillors do, and we just cannot accept that. It relegates local councils to the role of mere consultees. In the national planning framework, we see a, a doctrine, a, a document rather, um, which will not have adequate scrutiny, which will set um, the mission for planning authorities as a delivery tool of that organism, and it is unacceptable. I will from Andy Wyman. Andy Wyman. I thank the member for taking intervention. It was one of the um, um, uh, amendments we did secure at stage two and indeed at stage three that the national planning framework will actually for the first time be subject to a resolution of parliament. So there should be, there should be a greater scrutiny. I think that's a fair point to concede. Alec Cole Hamilton. No, I, I absolutely accept that. I, I don't still believe it has the necessary scrutiny that we as Liberal Democrats would have liked to see, but I recognise the progress made at stage two. As I do indeed in, in some of the debates I sat in on at stage two, I'm grateful for the forbearance of committee members. It is not a committee on which I am a member, but I did a, a, obtain a number of changes in that process which I was grateful for. Um, the one that survived I think is actually going to be really important in terms of uh, forcing local authorities to produce reports which uh, denote the obligations or planning commitments of developers in section 75 and the like um, that they have not yet delivered on. I hope very much that that will see an end to shameful practices by deliverers who make false promises to communities before reaping the profits of a development and not delivering on their obligations to planning gain. That is the one amendment that survived. My other amendment sadly did not. Yesterday I had a rather bizarre debate around uh, the protection of Greenfield and the suggestion that my amendment uh, secured at stage uh, two would have somehow banned any development on Greenfield. It, that is not the intention uh, in any way. If you wanted to extend your house, you could reasonably um, suggest to the local authority that it's not possible to build on Brownfield because that Brownfield is not attached to your house. I think that would be a completely acceptable reason to allow you permission to proceed. It is, as Andy Whiteman said, a bill of missed opportunities. Whilst we have different approaches to this, I, Liberal Democrats did want to see reform on appeal rights as well. Our own vision was rejected at stage two for that. But frankly, this is the needle returns to the start of the song on this. Yet again, we go round and round again in recognition that this appeal rights right now do not work for communities. And this represents... I need to the member's progress, closing in 30 seconds. I am closing in 30 seconds. On holiday lights, there's an Edinburgh MSP with an interest that I refer people to. I still think we have missed a trick in not being able to regulate, use this bill to properly regulate uh, the holiday light market, which is hollowing out cities like Edinburgh. We have not grasp the opportunity to protect things like wild land or to regulate hill tracks. Um, presiding officer, I'll finish with this. Presi we're told that planning bills come every 10 years. Well, that's a great shame, and I hope very much that the next planning bill comes sooner, and I look forward very much to repealing this one from the government benches. Thank you. So sorry. We're very, very tight for time. It's open debate, very, very tight speeches, and that means don't overgo over, uh, over your four minutes. James Dorner, followed by Alexander Stewart. Now, I'm surprised that you said that as I was getting up to speak, presiding officer, but thank you for that, and thank you, Alec, for that wee joke just at the end of your speech there. 
Order. As a convener of the Local Government Communities Committee, I am truly delighted that we have reached stage three of the Planning Scotland Bill. After the successful passing of the Fuel Poverty Bill, as a committee, we are now nearing the end of the legislative process for a second bill in as many weeks. A marked contrast to the inaction at Westminster, showing once again this Parliament that truly works for the people of Scotland. The work at stage one was truly gargantuan, and I can say that without bias as I was not a member of the committee at the time. The committee made visits all over Scotland, took part in a major planning conference in Stirling, and engaged with school students in Scottish Youth Parliament. Also took evidence from 25 different organisations at formal meetings, producing a very thorough report making recommendations in relation to every major aspect of the bill. I want to pay tribute to the colleagues who were on the committee at the time, except for maybe Graham Simpson because of his comments, his opening comments, uh, but particularly then convene on my colleague Bob Doris for their commitment and hard work. More importantly, I thank the many professionals, community bodies and individuals who engaged with the committee at stage one and indeed throughout the bill's progress, which informed at, uh, at times passionate views. Ultimately, planning is about communities, homes, jobs and a quality of life issues. And because of this, the debate has sometimes been passionate and even on occasion heated. But that's no bad thing and it only goes to underline the importance of the reforms we've been considering. I actually became convener of the Local Government Communities Committee on the very first day of our consideration of the bill at stage two. And I believe, to be honest, that Bob didn't get shuffled off except for it was he needed a rest after having to put up with you through the whole stage one, Graham. Uh, <laughs> and since that day in September, the parliamentary process has been a bit of a marathon. I'm reliably informed that this was the longest stage two in the parliament for well over a decade and the longest stage two ever considered by the local government committee. I'm sure I speak for all committee members when I say we hope this record stands for a very, very, very long time. In total, 394 amendments were laid. And looking back, it feels as if they were considered over the same number of meetings, but actually it was only seven. Many non-committee members took part in our proceedings, again reflecting the very wide interest that there has been in the bill throughout. And I sincerely like to place on record my thanks to all my committee members, our fabulous clerking team, along with our colleagues from SPICE, everyone who appeared before the committee, and of course to the Minister and all his officials. And it's fair to say that the bill that emerged at stage two was a rather different beast to the one that went into it, with well over 100 amendments agreed to, adding to or removing text from the bill. This included new provisions on key matters, including on the agent of change principle to protect live music venues, on planning permission for short-term lets, on the call-in of applications, on enhanced community engagement, and on a whole host of other important matters, which, if I listed them now, would take up all the remaining time in my speech and get me into trouble from the presiding officer. OK. We've had two days, two long days of great debates and 40 different groups of amendment, and we're now at the home straight. And, presiding officer, despite what we've heard from some of my colleagues here, who take the credit for any good bits that are in the planning bill at stage three and say the rest of it's rubbish, these reforms will create an effective planning system that will help deliver the housing, infrastructure and investment that current and future generations need. It will strengthen and simplify the planning system and will ensure planning better serves Scotland's communities and economy. And I look forward to seeing how these reforms will shape a fairer and more equal Scotland in the future. Thank you very much. I call Alexander Stewart, who followed by Neil Finlay. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I've mentioned before in this chamber, having been a former councillor for 18 years, I know too well the issues that can be raised by the planning process. And we have seen many amendments go through over the stage of this bill, but there has been some real progress. While planning is often characterised as a zero-sum game in which men, there are winners and there are losers, what we want to see is planning should be a place for people and should be of good development. We need more houses, everyone acknowledges that, and we believe that the mass, vast majority of people are not against development in its faith, but they are against development that has not got the necessary infrastructure requirements. The bill has come a long way from where it started and was originally tabled. I think that many of the amendments have been put forward have served to strengthen the bill. With that in mind, I have always thought it is important that we do all we can to encourage communities to constructively assist an early stage to ensure that the planning process. 
I think that the introduction of local place plans that will follow in communities is a greater say, and that's exactly what we want to see in a positive step. In the early stages of this bill, we were concerned about the time, the effort and the money which communities would require to put into development. And that has now taken place. And I think that the concerns have now been erased uh, from what we saw in stage two. In stage two, yes, we, we ended up in a guddle. There's no question about that. But and in stage three, we've managed to iron out many of these problems. I welcome the fact that there's now a commitment for greater public consultation in the planning authorities will formally be required to take any local place plan into account when formalising their local development plans. That is very welcome. Another uh, community engagement issue and one that is much more uh, contentious uh, during the debate was that of the third party right of appeals. Uh, as previously stated on the bill, we said that we would closely examine the case for this and we did so. Uh, we concluded that such a change would simply further slow up the planning process and stifle development, but also become clear that the status quo was not an option. We therefore sought to uh, research and to compromise and get a balance out of the whole process, Deputy Presiding Officer, and that has been achieved. The changes in the amendments that have come forward about mediation uh, will be an integral part of the planning process and not just something that will attempt one, but it will actually mean something and there'll be much more uh, a development and there'll be much more progress. Bringing two different points of view together can often be difficult, but I'd like to, but time is tight. Uh, 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 in reality, it is difficult to have two points of view coming together. But what we have seen is common ground here. And I pay tribute to my colleagues, Graham Simpson, Adam Tompkins and Jeremy Balfour, for their measured contributions in this entire process. I am proud of the, the constructive role that the Scottish Conservatives have played in strengthening this bill at every stage to ensure that we end up with fundamentally better planning processes going forward. We are protecting the environment. We are protecting older and disabled people. We are ensuring ensuring that there is much more process taking place. We are attempting to ensure that mediation goes forward. So good planning requires communities, developments and councils to work together constructively to build these houses that we need and we so communities want to see. We are ambitious about what we want to see for our, our planning process and that has taken place. This is by no means an easy task, Deputy Presiding Officer, but I think that the bill as it now stands will come some way to helping us achieve our objectives and that's exactly what we want to try and do to ensure that the objectives of this bill are better for communities, are better for individuals, are better for people and I support the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me, I call Neil Finlay, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Finlay. President Officer, is it three minutes or four? Three. Um, President Officer, I want to, uh, it was planning that got me into elected politics, and I want to focus on why, uh, how planning impacts on communities and how this bill has failed them. Because I saw, over that time, uh, developers with deep pockets hire consultants to write so-called independent reports, produce glossy documents and buy off opponents. When applications were refused, they had the right to appeal refusals and resource public inquiries. Communities, on the other hand, have no resources, no consultants, no lawyers, no expert witnesses for hire and no right of appeal. Some found themselves thrown into the maelstrom of a planning inquiry, where they were required to invest huge amounts of time writing precognitions, preparing their case and being questioned by lawyers and even QCs with zero resources available to them. How on earth is that fair? It isn't. It's a democratic outrage that that is still happens. I want to paraphrase a letter I received almost 20 years ago from Mary Allison, who was objecting to an open cast coal application in Blackridge. She said, no matter how open ministers claim the planning system to be, communities are intimidated by the power of the professionals they face. Their views as residents are dismissed as less competent or credible than these so-called experts. But professional presentations are simply a collection of information. They are not right or wrong until we bring our values and judgments to their interpretation and can assess whether the community or the developer is set to gain or lose by a development. Those who present information as scientific evidence are elevated to a position of greater value than the community who may, for various reasons, struggle to express their individual or community position. Personal, emotional and moral values are the centre of our society, yet because they are subjective, they can easily be disregarded. Scientific evidence can be just as subjectively gathered, but objectively presented. So why does a study conducted one day by a so-called expert from outside the community mean more than the daily lived experience of someone who has lived there all their life? 
Presiding officer, here is an example. I value the rugged moorland of my home village. It's where I fished, it's where I camped and walked and cycled growing up. The landscape gives me a sense of place and who I am. It's valuable to me and my community. It cannot be recreated. This is not nimbyism. This is about community-led development that is popular support, not a neoliberal planning system where profit and economic growth trumps everything. President officer, officer, this week the SNP, the Tories and their business allies have stitched up this planning bill. The dogs in the street know it. On equal rights of appeal, on short-term lets, they have shamefully let communities down. Bought and sold for good developers gold. They had a chance to introduce equality and they miserably failed in a shabby deal across the chamber with the front bench of the SNP and the Tories. Thank you very much, Mr Finlay. Can I just say, with the avoidance of doubt, Kenneth Gibson has four minutes, Jeremy Balfour and Annabelle, Annabelle Yoon each have three minutes. That's for political balance. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you for that, President Norris. That's very helpful. Uh, I, I, um, today's debate is a culmination of countless hours of work and contributions from numerous people and organisations across Scottish society. As a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, myself and colleagues have heard, ev heard evidence from numerous organisations uh, and uh, the engagement of the Housing Local Government Housing Minister Kevin Stewart, uh, um, Kevin Stewart was also invaluable. I would like to offer sincere thanks to everyone who contributed. This process would have been impossible without the evidence that led to 394 amendments being submitted at Stage 2 and 223 ahead of Stage uh, 3. Uh, journalist Alistair Grant described the Planning Scotland Bill as, and I quote, the three most distressing words in the English language. However, consultant uh, architect Malcolm Fraser, who gave evidence at stage one, said planning should be a wonderful, joyful thing. I think most of us have a view somewhere between those two extremes. This bill to overhaul the current planning system and amplify the voices of local people and communities uh, um, was, was brought forward um, to take that through the whole planning process. And to touch on broad sections of the bill, part one enhances the role of the national planning framework, removing the requirement to produce strategic development plans while introducing a new right for communities to produce their own local place plans. Part two provides for simplified development zones to front load scrutiny of potential sites, delivering consents through zoning land. Part three changes development management process to improve efficiency, support local consultation and move towards localised decision making. Part four strengthens planning authorities' ability to effectively use their powers to ensure appropriate enforcement of unauthorised development and widen the scope for charging fees in relation to planning functions while taking a more structured approach to performance improvement across planning services. The final part provides for the introduction of an infrastructure levy payable to local authorities linked to development to fund or contribute to projects that incentivise development delivery. It was important to me that this bill contained provisions to support the needs of older people and disabled people in Scotland, and I thank Aid Scotland in particular for their assistance with my amendments at stage two, which sought to place the high needs of older and disabled people at the heart of the national planning framework. Good accessible housing is central to the health and independence of older people and disabled people, and I'm pleased that under this bill, the NPF will contribute to improved outcomes for older people and disabled people. Ministers are now required to publish a statement on how this will be achieved. And I was therefore pleased at the Minister's willingness to engage with myself, Graeme Simpson, and other colleagues who are willing to engage with him cross-party to take forward the spirit of those amendments while streamlining the bill to avoid unnecessary duplication and cost. This involved me removing some of my own amendments, but what is important is not whose amendment is in the face of the bill, but what the bill can achieve in practice. In terms of older people and disabled people, I'm delighted that our hard-working and listening minister has delivered. Residing officer, following a somewhat arduous process, we now have a better bill that more closely responds to the planning needs of Scotland's people uh, and communities. Planning requires a system which balances the needs of many. And it's quite disappointing that what we've seen uh, uh, this afternoon is some gripes from Labour, Greens and the Liberal Democrats who seem to think that, uh, uh, that um, this uh, bill as it currently stands is actually worse than the status quo. I'm, I'm actually struggling to understand how they could possibly actually believe that having gone through what we have uh, uh, over the last 18 months or so throughout this entire process. They clearly want to throw the baby out with the bath, bath water. But I believe that we have now arrived with a more coherent, fair and inclusive system that will work for Scotland and I urge all members to vote for it at decision time. Thank you very much. I now call Jeremy Balfour to follow by Annabel Yu. Mr Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And uh, can I thank uh, the opportunity to be able to uh, briefly contribute to this uh, final debate. Can I start by uh, congratulating uh, the Minister, uh, his team and all the members of the committee uh, for getting us where we are uh, today. Um, I have to say I disagree fundamentally uh, with um, 
the other three opposition parties. Um, I do actually think we have a bill uh, that is workable and is better than the present system um, at the moment. Could it have been better? Well, clearly, if all my amendments had been accepted, that would have been the case. But I do think we are uh, far better down the road than we were uh, several years ago. Um, I say that as someone like others within this chamber who used to be a local councillor and who used to sit on the planning uh, committee here in Edinburgh. Um, and I do think, and I completely disagree with Alex Cole Hamilton, but I, I do not think this is taking away power uh, from local councils. And I think, in fact, it will help local councillors come to decisions. And ultimately, in 99% of cases, that is where uh, the power uh, should lie. Um, and because they know their local communities, and I think the bill allows this to do. Um, I have been, I have to say, frustrated, um, perhaps even more than the Minister, by the debate that we've had um, around appeals and third party rights of appeal in particular. For me, many people have painted this in a very simplistic way, that it is the community against a developer. And I have to say, in my time as a local councillor, again here in Edinburgh, that was hardly ever the case. Almost on every controversial planning application that came forward, it was some of the community wanted it and some of the community didn't want it. And I have to say, in, in all the debates that I heard over uh, both in committee and also here over the last uh, two days, uh, no one addressed those who were in favour of the development going ahead. Where did they get their voice? Where were they allowed to say, we want this to go ahead? And I think it was way over simplistic. I'm afraid my time's almost gone. It was over simplistic to say it's community against developer. It, it was never that simple in my time. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I am particularly pleased, um, like uh, Kenny Gibson, who has spoken previously, that we have greater um, rights for disabled and older people in this, in this bill. And I do think one of the things that this bill, and I said this list yesterday, I do think this bill will stand out is that we were going to change the way that people do public toilets. That may seem very simple, very straightforward, but actually for the Scottish economy, and more important for families and individuals, this will radically change what it's going to look like over the next 50 years. And for that, I'm grateful for the support of all the chamber, and I certainly will be happy to vote uh, for this in a few minutes' time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Balfour. Call Annabel Ewing, then closing speeches. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. In the time I now have available, I'll focus on a few issues only. First, it is vital that local communities have a meaningful role in the planning process, and I know very well from constituents that in many cases they feel literally under siege from developers. And whilst there will never be a, a system that can be devised that will please everyone, I am encouraged by the approach of the bill to front load community engagement. This was the approach recommended by the Independent Planning Review Panel, which concluded that it would be more beneficial to use available time and resources to focus on improved early engagement. I'm also encouraged that statutory guidelines are to be drawn up on what effective community engagement is to comprise. And it will be important to ensure that these guidelines provide for meaningful engagement if we want to keep faith with impacted communities across Scotland. The role of the local place plan is another important development, but again, it will only be of relevance to local communities if they have, in fact, the wherewithal to get involved. On the issue of ser serial applications, I am pleased to see that the relevant period has been extended from the current two years to five years. However, this will only be worth the paper it is written on if local authorities actually exercise their powers here, which does not appear to be the case at the present time. I would ask the Minister, therefore, to now take this issue up directly with COSLA, as by failing to deal with serial applications, local authorities are letting down the communities they are there to serve. Uh, on local health service impacts, I'm pleased to note too that there is to be a greater focus on this issue in the planning process because this issue is raised time and again by local communities. And finally, I would like to say a few words about the third party right of appeal issue. In fact, these proposals were rejected yesterday by this parliament by 93 votes to 25. I do not think anyone would claim that this was an easy issue, but I do believe that the parliament has reached the best decision. As I said at stage two, the body of evidence was not in favour of a third party right of appeal being introduced into the planning system in Scotland. And it is worth noting that there is no third party right of appeal in any country in the UK. And in Ireland, where there is such an appeal process, it is interesting to note in any event that very few decisions have been wholly reversed. No such third party right was recommended by the Independent Planning Review Panel. Uh, and indeed, we received strong representations against the introduction of such a right of appeal by a myriad of relevant uh, bodies. 
presiding officer, across Scotland, people need homes, they need workplaces and they need facilities. So what we therefore need to see is those objectives being met, but in accordance with a robust, fair and straightforward planning process. That is the only way that we will restore faith in the planning process. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, and thank you to members for their shortened speeches, which they all kept to, uh, despite the demands on them. And I now call Monica Lennon to close for Labour. Please, Ms Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll begin by, um, again, referring to my register of interest as a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. And I recall that when I went to planning school at the University of Strathclyde, back in 1997, um, that even then I had a deep interest in the power dynamics that play out in our communities and that ultimately influence the decisions that shape the places where we live, work and play, to paraphrase uh, Patrick Geddes. So for me, the obsession about equal rights of appeal is fundamental to how our planning system operates and in whose interests it serves. Um, there are many people to thank, so I'll add my thanks to the Local Government and Communities Committee members, the clerks, all the stakeholders, but the many, many people and organisations who gave us uh, written evidence and also gave us oral evidence. And as you should when you're thinking about planning, you have to get out of Parliament. So I was uh, very pleased to spend time with Graeme Simpson at a consultation event or engagement event in Motherwell in the region that we represent, where people did make quite clear at that session, and I've just looked at the committee's um, report on it, that people felt quite strongly that the current appeal system works against communities and undermines that confidence that we all want people to have. So I just wanted to remind Graeme Simpson of that because we haven't come into the, the, the process, I think, to make cheap political points. I think uh, James Dornan has reflected on how much scrutiny actually happened. And I thank James Dornan and Bob Doris for, uh, for um, their convenership. But the fact that over 100 amendments were passed shows how much collaboration and consensus there actually was. So Graham Simpson knows the arguments very well. Um, Graham Simpson also said at stage two that there is no doubt that the present system is lopsided and that the government has not addressed this in the bill. And they talked about equal rights of appeal and whether, you know, would ERA lead to a more robust plan-led system? And I'm afraid, whilst we did support mediation, because it's not going to do any harm, but it's not going to do a great deal of good. So I just say to Graham Simpson, I know that he said that we've been talking rubbish and, and so on and so on, but you know, we, we did work really, really hard together with Andy Whiteman and spent a lot of time on that. And I, and I think privately Graham Simpson will be disappointed um, as, as many of us are. But again, we wanted to make sure that planning is actually going to deliver better outcomes for all the communities that we live in and the people we represent. That's why we've talked an awful lot about improving health and trying to reconnect planning to public health. I think Andy Whiteman's made the point very well many times about planning has lost its way and become a wee bit too bureaucratic at times. There have been some positive um, Amendments. I think that the work that, that Lewis MacDonald has led on, on Agent of Change and speaking up for live music venues um, has been really important. But obviously there's been some disappointments along the way, particularly on short term lets. And there are strong feelings in the chamber and outside the chamber. We don't have a lot of time. It is a great disappointment that we have to say that we're not supporting um, the bill because I think all of us wanted to really maximise the, the opportunity. If I can just end with quoting Claire Simons from Planning Democracy because it's about the community voice, that's what we need to hear. She says we're deeply disappointed with this bill which has been a huge missed opportunity to transform the way we do planning. Scotland needs to take a different approach to development to tackle key issues such as climate emergency. This bill reinforces a business as usual approach. And then she says, it is a bitter pill that this is a bill that has nothing to offer in terms of citizen empowerment. I think it's quite sad that that's how communities in Scotland feel, Minister. Thank you very much. And I'll call on Adam Tompkins to close for the Conservatives. Five minutes, please, Mr Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, at stage one um, of this uh, bill, some 13 months ago, 29th of May last year it was, I said this in the um, stage one debate. The purpose of planning is to facilitate and enable growth in Scotland's economy. 
Uh, to grow the economy, we need development, and to engineer development should be the focus of the planning system. Of course, development needs to be environmentally sustainable, and of course, growth needs to be socially inclusive. But first and foremost, there does need to be growth. And the job of the planning system is to help make that happen, to facilitate it, and not to get in its way. And our approach, presiding officer, to this bill throughout the process, throughout the entire process, all three stages of it, has been informed by those principles. And I'd like to start by welcoming the fact that at least since stage two, mainly since stage two, uh, the government has sought to work with us uh, to ensure as best as possible that the bill delivers on this core mission. And I think it does. I think it passes that test. I think this bill, uh, when we uh, enact it in a few moments' time, will help to secure uh, growth, environmentally sustainable growth, socially inclusive growth that will help uh, the development of the uh, Scottish economy. And that is the purpose uh, of the planning system, not at the moment, Mr Whiteman. Um, uh, let me give two examples of the ways in which I think this bill has been improved during the course of its passage through this parliament that uh, will uh, help deliver on that ambition. First, with regard to master plan consent areas, as they are uh, now to be called, uh, where, uh, which, were, uh, which, which was a, a part of the bill that was amended uh, at stage two in uh, a number of amendments in my name that were accepted, I think, unanimously by, uh, by the committee. Uh, and secondly, with regard to the welcome reintroduction um, uh, of a spatial uh, of, sort of regional uh, spatial strategies. I know that the minister had as one of his ambitions going into this bill the removal of the need for strategic planning. Uh, I, I absolutely understood the case for that. The case for that was about um, removing unnecessary duplication in the Scottish planning system. But at the same time, and as a number of us pointed out, uh, both on the Labour benches and on the Conservative benches, um, strategic planning has a, very, a valuable role in driving forward Scottish uh, economic growth, seen most recently and most importantly through the uh, impact that city and regional growth deals are having across uh, the city, not least uh, in my, uh, not across the country, not least in my own uh, city of Glasgow. And I think that the Minister has done well, if I may say so, in finding a compromise between his desire not to have duplication at this level and our desire not to see uh, regional uh, um, uh, strategic planning lost entirely from the face of our planning system through the introduction uh, the, uh, at stage three of regional spatial strategies, which as he said uh, when we were debating the set of amendments, are agile, are better able to reflect and refine regional needs and priorities. They are healthily bottom-up, I think, rather than top-down, and they get the balance right between central and local uh, government. So these are examples of ways in which I think the bill has been improved consistently with the principled approach that we've taken to the bill throughout all three stages of its consideration. There are things that are still not in, I, I, mean, I just don't have time, I'm sorry, Mr. Whiteman. There are things which are, which are still not in this bill, which I regret are not in this bill. And let me just say a few things about um, uh, land development capture or land development, land, uh, land, land, land value capture or land value sharing, as it, as it might now be called, because that's something that we talked about at stage one uh, and indeed at stage two. And I note that in the recent recommendations made by the Scottish Land Commission to Scottish ministers just last month, um, Shona Glenn of the Scottish Land Commission said this, the debate about how publicly created uplifts in land value should be shared between society and private landowners is one that has waxed and waned for decades. There is a strong public interest, presiding officer, there is a strong public interest justification for pursuing policies that would enable more of the publicly created increases in land values to be used to help make places where people want to live, live and work, I would have said. Now, I accept, as she says, that there is no quick fix for this, but we do need to find ways to establish a more collaborative approach to placemaking, and I do want to continue to press the Minister that land value sharing or land value capture should be part of that mix. We recognise, however, that there were flaws, fatal flaws, in our attempts to get land value capture onto this bill at stage two in the context of master plan consent areas, not least um, ECHR compliance. But our agreement, Minister, our agreement that, uh, the, that these amendments should be taken out at stage three should not be misinterpreted. We have not given up on the idea and we will continue to pursue uh, the government on it. Finally, uh, presiding officer, I want to say something about agent of change. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that for the first time in Scots planning law, this bill puts the agent of change pr principle unambiguously on the face of primary legislation. The agent of change principle shifts responsibility for mitigating the impact of noise from an existing music venue to a developer moving into the area. 
In essence, this is my last sentence, presiding officer, it means that those bringing about a change take responsibility for its impact. That's a key change that this legislation makes. It would be very interesting to see if Lewis, Lewis, uh, Lewis MacDonald in a few minutes votes against the bill that puts this principle Thank you. on a Thank statute. You. Thank you. I uh, know. I uh, know. Oh, you were, on your, you were on your feet for a moment, but you're back down again. No, you can't intervene. You can't just have a wee chat. Uh, thank you for your whatever. Uh, <laughs> I, call, I call on Kevin Stewart to wind up the government minister. Uh, President officer, uh, first of all, can I put on record my thanks to everyone who is engaged in this process from the very beginning uh, to where we are now, which is not the end of the road, and I'll come to that in a little while. But in particular, I'd like to thank my Bell team, who have been uh, exceptional uh, in all of this. In particular, Andy Kinnaird uh, and Jean Waddy, who have been absolute stars uh, in terms of all of this. Um, President officer, um, one of the things uh, which Mr Whiteman pointed out is my uh, kind of love affair with the Aberdeen City Local Plan of 1952. Uh, he quoted uh, 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 from it earlier on. I'll paraphrase, uh, because Tom Johnson in that foreword always said, also said that the only thing to stop uh, the delivery of this plan was the red weevils of bureaucracy. And I'm afraid that after stage two, uh, there were far too many red weevils of bureaucracy that would have held up the delivery uh, of uh, uh, development here in Scotland. And I'm glad, I'm glad that folks have chosen to work together in a lot of cases to make sure that we get it right now. I'm going to turn to a few things that were said during the debate. Uh, Mr Rowley um, said that the bill does nothing for uh, funding infrastructure like education and medical facilities. Well, the infra infrastructure levy proposals explicitly mentions uh, these things. He also said that the bill does not address a lack of funding for planning. Well, it does, because actually streamlining the processes will free up money to ensure that local authorities can do much more community engagement. That is something that I wanted to see right from the start. Uh, Ms Ewing. Uh, in her uh, uh, contribution, said that planning authorities should use their powers more, their existing powers, and new powers introduced in, uh, in the bill to effectively safeguard communities. And I agree completely and utterly with that. And I think as well as strengthening uh, all of the things that we've done, providing elected members with training opportunities hopefully will help there too. Now I want to turn to, um, uh, to comments that were made by Alex Cole Hamilton, by Mr Rowley uh, and by Mr Whiteman, but particularly Alex Cole Hamilton, um, because he said that the bill assume, uh, assumes that a group of Edinburgh-based bureaucrats know better than communities across the country. Well, this bill includes a range of measures to give local planning authorities and local communities more powers. And this includes the power for local authorities to bring forward controls on short-term lets. Rather than imposing an Edinburgh-based solution on the whole country, uh, we uh, in have ensured during the course of this bill that communities can make their own choices in these regards. I agree um, that um, planning, uh, as well as strengthening communities, should be there to uh, ensure sustainable economic growth. Uh, and I think that is something that we all accept. Presiding officer, um, one of the things which I would say to those folks who have indicated that they're going to vote no uh, tonight uh, and try and vote down this bill is they'll be voting no to all of these things. A clear purpose for planning, putting the long-term public interest and sustainable development at the heart of the system. A stronger national planning framework, which is approved by this parliament after fuller scrutiny. Much better arrangements for strategic and local development planning that will address the problems of the current system. Statutory support for climate change, rural communities, disused railway lines, water refill locations, public conveniences, changing places, toilets, open space, space, 
play biodiversity, biodiversity forestry and woodlands. They will also be voting against the recognition of the role of planning in supporting health inequalities. They will be voting against protection for live music venues. They will be voting against more consistent training for councillors. They will be voting against a, per a performance improvement coordinator to support authorities and everyone who engages with planning, which is something that stakeholders wanted. And they will be voting against a right for communities to plan their own places and new opportunities to broaden engagement and development plans, including for disabled people, older people, gypsy travellers, children and young people. In order to ensure um, that uh, we got this right. At every stage, I asked the chief planner of this country, will this bill improve the system? At many points during this process, he said no. He says today that yes, this will improve the system and build upon what we have before. It's now time to get our sleeves up, grasp the opportunity and work hard together with communities to deliver great places. Thank you very much. That concludes the debate on stage three of the Planning Scotland Bill. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 17883 in the name of Graeme Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to next week's business. And any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Graeme Day to move the motion. Uh, move, presiding officer. Uh, thank you. And I call on Elaine Smith. Ms Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I wish to make comment rather than speak against. But as you'll be aware, Labour's whip is unavoidably not here today. So in her absence, can I express concern about the seven o'clock decision time on next Tuesday? This has not been a very family-friendly parliament recently. Can I ask that time management be controlled? This week's contributions seemed more akin to speeches instead of the previous approach which was about two minutes maximum, which was about two minutes maximum to move amendments at stage three. Scottish Labour will reluctantly vote for the business motion, but we do so in the sincere hope that decision time can be brought forward from the 7pm proposal that is in uh, this business motion, which has been brought forward this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Do you wish to respond? Yes, very briefly on behalf of the Bureau. Uh, can I give the member the assurance that the, uh, members of the Bureau always seek to have decision times that are in keeping uh, with the established pattern? Uh, can I also associate myself on behalf of the Bureau with her remarks about concise contributions that would go some way to uh, avoiding situations like those we're encountering? Thank you very much. I now put the, uh, say the question is that motion 17883 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed. There's one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 17781 in the name of Kevin Stewart on the Planning Scotland Bill be agreed. Members should cast their votes now. The result of division is yes, 78, no, 26, and there were no abstention. The motion is therefore agreed, and the Planning Scotland Bill is passed. Uh, that uh, concludes the decision time, and I close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>